I made a short the other day where I said that I was going against the advice of my toddler's pediatrician. And understandably, I got some concern with that. And so I realized I should probably make a video sharing how I learned to advocate for my son who has some unique medical needs and how I make sure to do it safely because obviously going against medical advice is a really serious thing and you only want to do it with a lot of consideration. So my son, right after he was born, needed immediate crisis life-saving medical care. It was a lot for me to get used to, to just suddenly hear, oh, by the way, he's on these different antibiotics and we gave him all these medications and we ran all these tests on him and, and this is what we're doing right now. And I'm like, okay, I guess you guys know what you're doing. It's just so hard, obviously, as a mother to see my kid going through all of that. But there wasn't any question in my mind of like, obviously they know what they're doing. I don't know anything about this. So yes, trust the experts. Great. And then on day eight, they said, we are not sure he is ever going to get off the ventilator. He might be on a ventilator for life. And they offered to remove life support. Now, this for us came completely out of left field. I wanted to scream like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. How dare you even suggest it? I was like personally offended. Now, I didn't like display any of this because they're just doing their job. You know, they're, I was just like, be respectful. Don't, don't say anything rude. But I was pissed. I was just like, he is, I am seeing daily improvement from him. I don't know how you could possibly suggest this. And, you know, but I also had this thought in the back of my mind of like, but, you know, okay, that's my knee-jerk reaction because I'm a parent, because I'm obviously very emotionally attached to the situation. Maybe they are seeing something that I don't because they have done this before. They are the experts. And so um, we really wrestled with that cognitive dissonance of like, yeah, but I think, I think he's going to make it. I think he's doing okay. Like, I don't even know why they're bringing this up. But the doctors required us to make a decision before they tried to take him off the ventilator again, whether we were going to just let him keep trying to breathe on his own. And if he struggles with it, then whether we were going to let him die or whether we were going to allow them to do a trach, which would be a more permanent access point for a ventilator. And so for two days, we were just like, are we like, are we just so emotionally wrapped up in this that we cannot see what is going on? Or are the doctors wrong? Like, it was just so confusing for us. And then another doctor got on shift. While we were sleeping, this was, we weren't allowed to sleep in the NICU, so we were at home. And the doctor just up and decided, eh, let's try him off the ventilator again. And she took him off the ventilator and he was fine. He never got back on the ventilator after that. And so that was my first experience with, oh, well, I mean, maybe we do know a little bit more than the doctors, at least in some areas when it comes to our kids specifically. And so that just planted the seed in the back of my mind. Um, I went back to, you know, the doctors know what's best, like, I'll just trust you guys, and I'm just here for my baby to comfort him and everything. But then he started crying. He would cry and cry and cry. And I don't know how familiar you are with a NICU, but usually babies are not crying for very long in it. He was the only one crying on the entire NICU floor. Other babies would cry for maybe a minute or two. He cried the whole time he was awake. And it was heartbreaking. He'd be awake for like 13 hours at a time, which is just ridiculous for a newborn. And the doctors came to me and they said, he's losing weight we want to supplement because we think your breast milk isn't enough. Now, we had been feeding him breast milk through a tube in his nose, a feeding tube, because he had no ability to suck or swallow. And I was like, so you're saying he's hungry? What about feeding him more milk? Like, as would happen if he was a typical healthy baby, he would just be drinking more milk. And they were so hesitant to do that. 
And I was like, why? They're like, well, there's a chance he might vomit it. And I'm like, okay, well, we could try it. Like, like, am I missing something here? Like, baby isn't gaining weight. Baby is still hungry. Baby is crying from hunger. How about feeding baby more? Like, I didn't think this was a big mental leap. And they really, really, really wanted to do um, formula. I got a couple second opinions and I talked with them a lot. I convinced them to bump up the volume a little bit more. And then when that wasn't enough, then I asked, what if we tried my hind milk instead? Which, if you're not familiar with breast milk, there's a part that's more watery and there's a part that's more fatty, that's more calorie dense. Depending on how you pump, you're able to kind of separate that out and have the more calorie dense milk be there. And so I was like, how about uh, doing hind milk instead? I can separate this out of the pump thing. I'm willing to do this. And they really wanted to do formula, but I was just, I kept asking questions. What are the risks if we try this? What are the risks if we try that? And I got them to the point where they were like, okay, we can try this. And sure enough, he started gaining weight again. And so that was my second experience where it was like, hmm, okay. Apparently, I do need to be a lot more active in this because I thought that, you know, doctors know what they're talking about, right? But in this case, they kind of had a formula, like literally, they had a formula for baby isn't gaining weight, put them on formula. Rather than baby isn't gaining weight, let's try to problem solve this in the way that is the healthiest possible option for that baby. Mother's breast milk is so much better for them than formula. Even in the NICU, they told me, we consider it prescription medication. That is gold. This is so important for him. And they drilled that into me. I was listening to what they were saying and then I would use them that back at them. Like, isn't it better to have like even more of this amazing milk that you're telling me it is? You know, and so eventually they agreed and eventually it worked. And then they told us that we think it's time to do a surgery to install a feeding tube directly into his stomach. It's called a G-tube. And the reason for this, they said, is, well, his inability to eat orally is the last thing keeping him in the hospital. And so it's not good for his development to stay in the hospital. If we do the surgery, then we can send him home. And this hit us completely out of left field because he was making daily progress with therapists to be able to learn how to suck, to learn how to swallow, to learn that milk is, is a good thing to eat. Um, he had really strong, they call it oral aversion, because he had had so many intubations and so much stuff shoved down his throat constantly. His gag reflex constantly checked. I mean, that sort of thing would cause anyone to be like, no, I don't want anything in my mouth. And so even as he was slowly relearning how to suck and how to swallow, we didn't know if he would ever be safe doing that. We didn't know if he'd ever want to do that. Some kids just decide, I don't want anything in my mouth and I'm done and they get a G-tube because of that. So we were working daily with physical therapists, with a occupational therapist, which was the swallow expert. And we were seeing daily progress. That was so encouraging to us that we were just like, this is incredible, he is incredible. We were over the moon. And then this came out of left field. And we were like, but, but, but he's improving. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you know, it's, it's not going to be anytime soon. And we we're like, okay, but surgery is kind of a major thing. I mean, if it takes him a couple weeks, then like, you know, isn't it better for him to just, you know, stay a couple weeks and then go home without having something inserted, you know, into his stomach from the outside. Like, isn't that better? And I could tell that they were actually getting worried about our resistance. And so I started leaving that more up to my husband because he was very, very against it. And it was really clear that he had this knee-jerk reaction against it. And I was worried that they were going to think we were bad parents for not seriously considering it. So I immediately went into the mode of, I have to demonstrate that I am seriously considering this. So I was asking, what are the risks? What are the other options? Um, what would ha what's the worst that could happen if we did it? 
if we did the surgery? What's the worst that could happen if we did not do it? Like, I was like, okay, I have to be the reasonable one here because my husband was just kind of going like, what? And I was just as emotionally against it as he was. But here's the thing, especially when it comes to your kid's medical treatment, is that you have to separate your emotional response from what is best for them. And you do have to take expert opinions into consideration. So I went home and I started contacting groups to find out what other people's experience was with this. And it turns out in Australia, they won't even do this G-tube surgery. I think it's until the kid's one year old or is it two years old? It's one or the other. I was like, okay, if that's how they do it, then it can't be too terrible to wait longer for this surgery. They were saying that he wasn't even drinking enough milk to do a swallow study to find out if he was safe to swallow more milk. But they were stopping him before he had the chance. So they would give him a bottle that would have like 10 milliliters in it, just tiny amount, just like that much. He would do okay with that, but then they would say he was struggling towards the end of that, so you know, we can't we can't go any further. I told the physical therapist, I want to be the one giving him a bottle. Up until now, they had not been letting me be the one to control the bottle. I said, I want to control the bottle. I want there to be more than 10 milliliters in it. And I want to be the one to decide when to stop. They were like, that's dangerous. And I was like, if anything goes wrong, we are in the best place possible for it. And surgery is dangerous too. You guys are asking me to make a decision to put him at risk for surgery. You know, my mom has a friend with a baby that was close to my son's age. He did this surgery, this G-tube surgery, supposed to be a really simple surgery, had major complications, had to stay several months in the NICU and get multiple additional surgeries, and has long-term complications from it. So yeah, that might be rare, but you're asking me to put my baby in a risky situation, to be put under anesthesia, to be cut open, to have this procedure. You're asking me to do that, but you're not willing to let my baby drink a little bit more out of the bottle. That's the situation you're putting me in. And when I put it that way, they were like, okay, all right, you can try it. And guess what? He drank so much. They scheduled the swallow study for the very next day. And the swallow study showed that The swallow study showed that he's not aspirating any milk, that he is swallowing okay. He was still struggling a little bit with how his mouth was organized, but that he was doing great. And they said, no one's going to limit him now. He can drink as much as he wants out of the bottle. And so less than, it was a, less than a week after we were told that, hey, you should get this G-tube surgery. And they were pushing it so hard. Even the receptionist was pushing us for it. The nurse was pushing us for it. Everyone was just like being evangelical. I am not kidding you, evangelical about this. One week later, he had his first full feed completely orally. And we had doctors coming to our room, thanking us for our advocacy. The medical director herself said, thank you so much. Without your advocacy, we never would have known what he was capable of. So, this is the background. His start to life had me discovering, hey, I actually have to step in here. I actually have to, to advocate for what I'm seeing because if what I'm seeing is different than what the doctors are seeing, I'm probably right in terms of day-to-day -day stuff. They're the experts in the medical stuff, but I am the expert in his day-to-day -day cues and in his progress. And I'm the one who's seeing that all the time. So I wanted to give that backdrop because that's the, the medical history that we live with. And my son was doing great with eating solid foods and he's also breastfed still. And just a few weeks ago, he slipped off of it. And the scary thing is that it is quite possible that is due to oral aversion, that he has just decided solid foods aren't my jam, guys. And there's no telling for certain if 
or when he will change his mind about that. What we learned through the NICU process and also through PT and OT afterwards, he was discharged at 11 months. His story is incredible. I can't wait to share the whole thing. But what we learned is that you have to follow his lead. He decides what he wants to do. And all we can do is kind of nudge him in one direction or the other. We can give him opportunities. We can make everything a really positive experience. That's what we can control. He controls whether or not he decides that he's going to eat. <laughs> And so currently, he's really hesitant about solid foods. I can offer him a dozen different foods, and he might eat one by each of two different foods. That's our current situation. It is scary how little he's eating. We have our pediatrician on board. Our pediatrician is getting a feeding therapist on board. We have a gastroenterologist that we've already established care with that we'll probably go back to if needed. There's kind of a process to this. And so... In the meantime, my son's pediatrician said, make sure to cut out all breast milk as soon as you possibly can because it's not recommended after the age of one. The American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends breastfeeding until age two, at minimum. He's not even one and a half years old yet. He enthusiastically will take as much milk from me as I can give him. You want to cut out the one food that he enthusiastically will take as much of it as I can give him. You want to cut that one out while he is struggling with food. You're serious? Are you serious right now? He was serious. My kid, I am lucky to get him to take two sips of Pediasure. Like, he is in a pretty precarious place right now. As a mom, it's my responsibility to try to make sure that he gets enough calories in his system. We're taking the advice into consideration. We are bringing more experts on board. And in the meantime, I am going to increase the one food that he will eat an unlimited amount of, which is my breast milk, rather than cutting it out of his diet entirely. <laughs> and so I create a short saying, my kid's pediatrician told me to stop breastfeeding him and I'm drinking lactation tea instead. I thought it was kind of funny. And people on the internet freaked out because I was ignoring medical advice. I am not going to take the medical advice that results in my kid not getting enough food. And yes, I am confident in it now. I have gone through enough in the NICU that when I see something like this, I'm going, this is a no-brainer. This is about doing what is best for my kid. And it's been quite a journey, but um, I, I think he's going to be okay and we'll be okay. So thanks for watching.